Good evening, and welcome to the June edition of Thought Leaders, the lecture series produced by Space Center Houston and proudly sponsored by UTMB Health. I am Dr. Chris Haas, NASA Flight Surgeon and Technical Integration Lead for the Orion Project, but I also work with UTMB's Aerospace Medicine Program as a professor in the Department of Family Medicine and faculty member of the UTMB School of Public and Population Health. I am excited to join you tonight in exploring the holoportation experiment, a futuristic tool that could prove invaluable as NASA and others investigate deep space. NASA's vision of travel to Mars and beyond brings with it a host of obstacles to be conquered through innovation. Timely communication between the flight crews in outer space and mission control back on Earth will become more difficult as distances increase. Holoportation could provide us an answer. Already introduced on the International Space Station, holoportation can, according to AXA, Aerospace's website, allow an engineer to simulate a walkthrough of a space station or for a doctor to appear in a patient's home. Tonight's speakers are Dr. Fernando de la Peña Yaca, President and CEO of AXA, my NASA colleague flight surgeon, Dr. Joseph Smith, and Dr. Dave Williams, former astronaut with the Canadian Space Agency and founder of Leap Biosystems. They will share their work with holoportation and what we consider to be wild, new technologies of today, innovations that can result in new discoveries and the advanced tools necessary to overcome obstacles in aerospace, medicine, and numerous other fields in the future. I look forward to learning more about and considering the possibilities of holoportation. Thank you for joining us for what should be a fascinating discussion. I hope you enjoy the lecture. Hello, I'm William T. Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston, a dynamic science and space exploration learning destination and nonprofit science center. We also have the privilege of serving as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. We share the story of human space exploration, past, present, and future, with more than 1.25 million visitors annually from around the world. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program, Virtual 3D Technology Helping to Advance Exploration, presented by the University of Texas Medical Branch. Our Thought Leader Series brings you space and science experts from across the country who provide insights and perspectives on space exploration. Space Center Houston offers robust learning experiences that enable you to be a part of NASA's mission. In addition to our extensive collections, you can experience new exhibits and live programming, so there's always something new. Now on to our program. We are on the verge of a new era of space travel. We need to better understand how astronauts will navigate the mental and physical challenges of deep space exploration. Scientists and engineers are using a holoportation technology that could mitigate some challenges of long-term space travel. This technology provides clinical and practical applications from telemedicine to behavioral support, something to help our mental health, and serves as a communication tool. In our discussion, we'll learn how holoportation technology, an innovative 3D version of telemedicine, is supporting astronauts on the International Space Station, and how it's being used on Earth in our June Thought Leader series, Virtual 3D Technology Helping to Advance Exploration, presented by UTMB. I'm delighted to welcome our panelists. Our first speaker is Dr. Fernando de la Peña Yaca, who serves as AXA's President and Chief Executive Officer, with 25 years of successful leadership in technology and engineering companies. Fernando serves on the Bay Area Houston Economic Partnership Board of Directors and chairs the Communications Committee of the Johnson Space Center National Management Association. Dr. De La Peña Yaca's lifelong passion for space exploration combined with IXA's leading edge expertise plays a key role in his support for NASA. Dr. De La Peña Yaca received a Discovery Channel Prize in 2010 for his work developing the Mexican Space Agency. He's the former president of the National Contract Management Association Space City Houston chapter at NASA Johnson Space Center. Our next presenter is Dr. Joe Schmidt, active NASA flight surgeon, retired Major General of the U.S. Air Force. He served as lead Orion Medical Operations Artemis missions, which will return astronauts to the moon. His patients are current astronauts and their family members, T-38 and X-15 pilots, shuttle, space station, and Apollo astronauts who have walked on the moon. Dr. Schmidt is an aquanaut and veteran of NASA Extreme Environment Missions, or NEMO, 
12. In October 2021, Dr. Schmidt became the first human to be holoported off the planet and into the International Space Station. He's a former deputy of the JSC Flight Medicine Clinic and the current medical operations representative to the Exploration Medical Capability Project. Our final presenter is Dr. Dave Williams, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Leap Biosystems Incorporated. The renowned physician, astronaut, aquanaut, author, and innovator brings his unique skills to lead Leap Biosystems Incorporated. Leap Biosystems provides innovations for healthcare. At Leap Biosystems, Dr. Williams and his team are passionate about space exploration, medicine, and humanity. Dr. Williams earned his medical degree from McGill University and was the director of the Department of Emergency Services at Sunnybrook when he became a Canadian astronaut. Between his two space flights, he was director of the Space and Life Sciences Directorate at NASA Johnson Space Center and deputy associate administrator for crew health and safety at NASA headquarters in Washington, DC. He retired from the Canadian Space Agency in 2008 and spent three years at McMaster's University as the director of the McMaster Center for Robo Medical Robotics before becoming president and CEO of South Lake Regional Health Center in Newmarket, Canada. Welcome to you all. I'm so excited about our conversation today, and I'd now like to ask each of you to make brief remarks before we get into our conversation. We'll start with Fernando. Thank you, William. Uh, my name is Fernando La Peña, president of AX Aerospace. We're a company located in Houston with uh, multiple uh, projects around the country. One of the most significant right now is the holographic teleportation. This is a new technology that in my mind is an evolution from video conference. In my mind, I can see three levels of communication. Level one, a telephone call. You only can share voice and hear the other person. Uh, level two, video conference is what we are having right now. However, we are limited to the size of our screen. It's a flat experience. The next one, which I enjoy it from science fiction, like movies from Star Wars or TV shows like the Star Trek, it's holographic teleportation. I remember uh, Princess Leia calling the, uh, for help to Obi-Wan Kenobi. Or in on Star Trek, one of the medical officers was a hologram. So I said, okay, that that may be something that we can do. And it was interesting because I always had that in my mind. A um, couple of years ago, I had the privilege of met Dr. Joe Schmidt. He's a general Air Force general, NASA surgeon, um, extremely great leader, a uh, very talented guy. And we uh, demonstrated our technology at, in Florida. Florida has one undersea facility under the sea, at the bottom of the sea that NASA used to train astronauts. And we demonstrated one of these uh, holographic versions for training. It was for a medical scenario. Uh, we had a NASA surgeon here in Houston, Texas, assisting an astronaut, a crew member, at the bottom of the sea. That simulation went very well. Uh, at the end, when I was having that feedback from Dr. Schmidt, he asked me, oh, this is very good. I love it. Um, but people don't really like avatars. Those look like cartoonists. What else can you do? And I said, well, sir, I hear that companies like Microsoft, they are working on something called holoportation. Um, they have a very nice studio. It's a called a, a Microsoft Studio. 106 cameras, they can capture you as a hologram, record you, create a file and send it to you and project you as a hologram. I he said, well, that would be interesting if we can do it uh, for a space station. And I said, okay, let, we, let's do that. However, we, we learned during the process that we cannot fly 106 cameras, we only can use one. And we had multiple limitations like five megabits per second, so if you remember five megabits per second, it's the bandwidth that you had with your iPhone 7 when it was Internet 3G. Um, so we figured out a way to make it happen, but I realized the importance of holographic teleportation. See the other person, see that volume, that body language, like if the other person is there, it's very powerful. Uh, and we're trying to combine that with haptics. It's not only see and interact with the other person, 
but also is the possibility of touch and feel the other person. So that's how we started this to make this dream come true, to be able to holographic teleport someone from NASA mission control to a space station, which is one of the toughest environments that you can imagine. And maybe Dr. Smith will talk more about that. And, but also we were able to holographic teleport someone, an astronaut, from the space station back to Earth which will have multiple applications in the future, like allowing the astronauts to socialize with their families. We live in a confined space during the COVID-19. It wasn't nice. Imagine living on the in the space station for six months or a year. I believe that this will be a powerful tool for the space station and for travels to the moon, Mars and beyond. Fantastic. That was absolutely fascinating. And I'm really excited to try out your new, newest technology. I had a chance to try out an earlier prototype and it was wonderful. Uh, I'm so excited to say we will now transition to hear from Joe Schmidt uh, to tell us a little bit about his background and experiences. Joe. Thank you, William, and thank you to Space Center Houston. What an incredible honor to be with you all today. Uh, I got interested in space and space medicine I'm barely old enough, back in 1969, I'm barely old enough that I remember them landing on the moon. My mother actually woke me up and said, you got to see this, and I was hooked. I was four years old. Fast forward, uh, I was completely hooked with all the Apollo missions, including Apollo 17. I remember telling my mother, I got a stomachache, I can't go to church today, because uh, the truth was that actually they were lifting off from the surface of the moon, and I wanted to see it. Um, fast forward, I followed along with the Apollo Soyuz and the cooperation between, at the time, the Soviets and the United States, and then through the Skylab missions and shuttle missions. And then I happened to be at a summertime, uh, uh, like a summer camp for space uh, biology, and there was a speech uh, from a fellow who was talking about aerospace medicine. And he said, that there's this field of medicine you can go into that combines both aviation and medicine. And I really liked physiology at the time, and I really liked aviation. I thought I wanted to be a pilot. And he said, by the way, there are these doctors that actually take care of pilots. And they they tell that the, um, the pilot that they're healthy enough to go flying. And I said, that's really interesting. Uh, and it requires going to medical school. So I decided, yeah, that's probably a good thing to go to medical school. Then he said, by the way, when you sign on the dotted line that they're healthy enough to go flying, they have to take you flying with them. And I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And then the guy said, there's also a group of these flight surgeons that take care of astronauts down at the Johnson Space Center. And so I knew exactly what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go work. And it so happened that I went to medical school and became a, an Air Force uh, flight surgeon and then came and worked at, at NASA. There are five elements of my job. I get to take care of astronauts in the flight medicine clinic. So I'm a, a family physician, but also an aerospace medicine physician. So I take care of active astronauts and then also the uh, astronauts from the X-15 and the Apollo era. So it's really like taking care of Lewis and Clark. And I'll tell them that and they'll say, I'm not that old. I'm not as old as Lewis and Clark. Of course not, but they are significant. They are incredible patriots and incredible explorers. And I get to work with them uh, regularly to see them for their annual exams and also handle anything that happens to them when it comes to just routine medical care. The second thing is I do is I am assigned to missions. And so for uh, shuttle, I took care of shuttle crews, and now I also work with the uh, Soyuz and the ISS crews as well. So we travel with our crew members. We go to Russia and then off to Kazakhstan and take care of them when, before they launch. And then uh, when they're on orbit, I work in mission control with the rest of the mission control uh, console operators, and we talk with them once a week. And that'll be important when we talk about holoportation and the, one of the uses of it. And then when they return, we take care of them when they return. We're often the, one of the first people to be there at the capsule and help retrieve them and, and get them back in great shape after they've been on their six-month mission. The third thing I'm doing now is I'm assigned to the Orion vehicle that's going to take us back to the moon and onto Mars. And with that, in our medical team, we're de developing new medical kits, as well as all the procedures to use in mission control and all the operational procedures to do the same thing, to launch our crews to around the moon and take care of them while they're on the surface of the moon and then return them safely to to uh, to uh, the Earth and through a splashdown. We're going to do it just like we did with the Apollo. And the fourth thing I do is I have to continuously train. Uh, 
half of what I learned in medical school is wrong and the other half I forgot. So I have to continuously read and get updated on the newest medical advances. And also we have to maintain our T38 as well as our console certification. So we're continuously training ourselves and we train other people. And then the fifth element is what I do is I call them special projects, which includes this hollow portation, which is to me a really incredible new technology that we're going to use to take care of astronauts and their family members, um, astronauts in orbit and family members on the ground. And the way the hollow portation took place was the, the project was that I, indeed I was working with Dr. Fernando de la Peñaca and we were working with a simulation with the Aquarius habitat, as Dr. Fernando talked about. There was a uh, crew member uh, who was playing like she was a physician and uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, and she was taking care of another crew member who simulated that he was having shortness of breath. And we determined through telemedicine that that person was having shortness of breath due to a collapsed lung, which is very unusual, but it's really uh, uh, very hazardous for the patient. And through telementoring using the HoloLens, we were able to direct the simulated um, procedure to actually help with that medical issue. And it was done successfully from here in Houston to Key Largo. And when Dr. Fernando was telling me about that, we, we were successful and he's, he said, by the way, let me show you some of this augmented reality. And he placed an object out in the lobby underneath a lampshade and said, Joe, go out and find that object. And I looked and it was underneath the lampshade. He told me that actually you could place that there and it would be there three days from now or three weeks from now in augmented reality. And then we talked as Dr. Fernando said, what else can we do with this? And he says, I have one more thing to tell you. It's about this hollow portation where you can actually take a person and put them in another location. And together we immediately saw the potential. We would like to take this to the space station. It took us about a year and a half to get all the permissions and, and all the technology lined up, but we were able to actually take the hollow portation and take us, uh, Dr. Fernando de la Pena Yaca and me, we were the first humans to go to orbit and we did a simulated medical exam. I actually used Dr. de la Pena's uh, knee and to demonstrate a knee exam. We also did cranial nerve exams and, and we demonstrated how to do a visual field. And then I, we grabbed all of the people that were in the mission control room that we were working with and we took them all to orbit. We did it a second time with Kayla Barron, who was in orbit on the International Space Station. And we made sure that we had a hollow portation handshake there and interacted. I knew I was on orbit when Kayla said, wow, you're, I never had this happen before, but you're in my personal space. It seemed that she took an image of me and she moved into the image. So it looked like I was really close to her, but we had a very wonderful conversation and uh, it really felt like I was with her and, and uh, she felt like I was with her on, on orbit. There are four basic use cases that we have for holoportation. Number one is to use it for pri private medical conferences where you bring your physician to orbit and they can talk with you just like you'd talk with a doctor in, in their office. The second thing which we recently did was you can bring private psychological, or private psychiatric uh, physicians and psychologists to orbit and do the same thing where they can interact with the crew members. The third thing which is really exciting is that we'd like to bring the family members on board to the station and have them interact uh, with their crew members because they are in complete incredible support to the crew members and the crew members they're away from their family for at least six months in these long duration mission missions they miss their families terribly and to be able to bring them to orbit and enjoy a meal with them and enjoy conversations i know that will be fantastic some of the other the fourth uh use case that we like to do is to bring up absolute experts uh, say uh, folks that are engineers or designers of the particular pieces of equipment that they could work together on something that's broken on the space station and work together on that. Uh, you'd also like to bring up VIPs and people that are special to the astronauts and bring them up, up on board as well. And Dr. Dave Williams is going to talk a little later too about our two-way holoportation where we bring folks down. So to me this is, I really felt uh, when I was four years old, I remember seeing them landing on the moon and it was something extreme, extremely special. Of course it was. And then the, in the early 80s, I saw the internet for the first time and used Telnet and used email. And 
tried to, you know, learn information on the internet, but I saw the promise of that. And when Dr. De La Pena introduced holoportation to me, it really felt like I was looking into, into the future. It really is science fiction becoming science reality. And looking forward, William, to talking more about holoportation and what we're going to do with it. That is just fascinating. I cannot wait to get into our conversation or discussion portion because I'm really fascinated about how this technology works and all its possible applications. Next, we're going to hear uh, from someone who's had some personal experience in space. Um, we're now turning it over to Dr. Dave Williams. Well, thanks very much, William, and I'm thrilled to be here today. Uh, thank you so much for the very kind introduction and to the team at Space Center Houston for making this all possible. You know, my experiences with holoportation were really quite unique, but I was very fortunate as a Canadian astronaut, originally an emergency trauma physician, but to be able to fly in space twice, help build the International Space Station, also do two underwater missions. For the most part, in all four of those different experiences that I had, we were focusing on space medicine, clinical procedures, understanding how the human body lives and adapts to working in extreme environments. Currently, I'm the CEO of Leap Biosystems, Systems, and with the four other founders, we were asked by the Canadian astronaut Mark Pathy to integrate his science and technology payload for the Axiom Aerospace AX-1 first really historic mission to the International Space Station, where we had three private astronauts bringing science and technology research experiments up to the International Space Station. It was truly remarkable. And of course, as you know, the story of the space station is really a story of collaboration. To achieve success in space, we have to work together. And the two-way holoportation technology was a great example of that, where the Leap Biosystems team was working with the Axiom team, working with the IXIT team, working with NASA to make this happen. And by the way, it's not easy doing two-way holoportation to the space station. We succeeded because all those teams worked together, brought it uh, to a successful conclusion on the Earth, literally a couple of weeks before we went and did it in space. And it was truly a remarkable experience. I can tell you, it was my fastest ride to the space station. You know, you climb aboard the space shuttle, you're traveling 25 times as speed of sound, but we're still arriving at the space station a couple of days later. Here I'm in mission control. Literally a second later, I'm in the U.S. lab on board the space station. Truly remarkable. I went up to the space station this time with Josh Kutrick, one of the other Canadian astronauts, and there we are on the U.S. lab looking around, interacting with the Canadian private astronaut Mark Pathy. Truly remarkable. But I think what's incredible about this is thinking about the future. And one of the challenges that we wrestle with that we can talk about more is latency and the signal and the amount of time it takes a signal to get from the Earth to the space station. For low Earth orbit, this is a fantastic technology. Using it anywhere on Earth, it's a fantastic technology. Going to the Moon and Mars, latency may be a challenge. Some of you might wonder, will we be able to do this? And I think what's really interesting is to challenge ourselves to think about how we might use this in the future. So imagine astronauts down on the lunar surface in a lunar habitat using two-way holoportation to communicate with crew members on a lunar space station that's orbiting the, the Moon. Or or using two-way holoportation to communicate between spacecraft. And uh, on my first space flight, STS-90 in 1998, we spoke to the uh, cosmonauts and one of the uh, NASA astronauts on board the Mir space station. Imagine being able to do two-way holoportation and being able to connect back and forth. It's an amazing technology and really represents what the future is gonna bring in terms of our ability to explore space. And to me, it's consistent with what we've demonstrated in NASA for years and what we're doing now in the private sector, simply making the impossible possible as we go forward and explore space. Wow, fantastic. Well, wow, great introductions by all of you about your backgrounds. So I guess I wanted to start with asking exactly how does it work? Uh, I think many of our, our, our viewers are wondering, they may be familiar with augmented reality, with virtual reality. It's become very popular in gaming. But actually, how does this, uh, the actual technology work? Don't share any trade secrets, but if you give us kind of the, the, a sense of the, the, for a lay person, how is it that one can tell, uh, use holoportation to speak with someone else? Thank you. So from the technical perspective, you also have three levels. Virtual reality, you have a, some glasses and you are inside of a computer generated environment. 
Augmented reality is like Pokemon Go. You can play with animations, but they cannot interact with you. Mixed reality is taking that. It's like augment, augmented reality, but the animations can interact with you. So the way that it works, imagine that we have admission control uh, at NASA. We have a camera that helps us to capture a holographic representation of the person of the ob or the object. And then we stream that using a computer to the space station. And on the space, uh, in the space station, they have these glasses called the HoloLens, which, which is a mixed real reality computer. So essentially it's like glasses, a little speaker uh, that generates a hologram for my eyes. But at the same time, I can interact with my environment. I can see another person as a hologram and interact with that person but also interact with my environment at the same time. For a two-way holographic teleportation, we replicated the same. The picture that you have right there um, shows a computer on a station, a camera, which is the same camera that we use for video games, uh, a Kinect camera, the one that you use for your Xbox or the same kind of cameras that you have on your cell phones. And we project that hologram back to, to Earth and someone on the ground will, can wear HoloLens or they can use their smartphones or any other device to interact with the holograms. So essentially it's a two-way communication coming on both sides one camera, which is a little different to recreate the hologram. And just very quick, to give you an idea about this, how this capture a hologram, if you are familiar with 3D printers, a 3D printer take multiple slices of an object and it creates multiple slices until it creates some volume. A hologram is the same, it's not different. Instead of having, it, it takes multiple pictures of someone in multiple layers, like a 3D printed object, but it creates a 3D printed hologram so I can see that volume in the space or in, an, in our, any other place. That is fascinating. I can imagine you describe some of the applications. There's so many and I was fascinated, uh, Joe, when you're talking about conducting a medical exam of Fernando's knee. But what is is there research happening now around haptics that you might actually be able to using holo technology somehow tactically because that's part of a medical exam, right? To to do some kind of a review to understand if, if somebody has some condition in their internal organs or skin or something of that nature. What's what's the status of developing a, a haptics feature? Oh, absolutely, William. You know, it you can do a lot of medicine just on the telephone, as a lot of people will do, and listen to a person's history. But to really, sometimes you have to diagnose people with your eyes and your ears and your hands often to be able to examine the patient. It's very, very important that that's done gently and, and also that you are able to uh, to feel lumps and bumps or if you're going to do surgery that you know how to retract the skin and you can feel when you're making, a, a, you know, an incision with your instrument. Those all will involve haptics and haptics in basic terms are you're feeling things uh, virtually. So I would use a set of gloves. That's one way to do it that has different pressure transducers on the gloves and I could in that virtual environment reach in with my ghost gloves and feel a patient's neck for their lymph nodes or or feel a, a lump or bump and then I would then the gloves would give me feedback on my hands to actually give me the sensation that I'm actually examining the patient and as I mentioned when, how you're going to make an incision you should be able to feel the scalpel as it makes the incision it's really really important that you're able to do that now how do you do that? I things are being developed now to be able to actually feel another patient with with virtual gloves. Can you use a robot to actually feel for you and then transmit that to you? Or or can you use the video itself to actually use ghost hands to feel the vid, the three-dimensional structure and then give sensations back into your hands to actually get that sensation so that it becomes a real to you that you're seeing the patient, you're hearing the patient. You're feeling the patient and they're actually the next step will be they could feel your hands on them to to be able to feel that exam. There are other, you know, haptic suits that people could wear that would actually 
you know, give that same pressure transducer sensation both to the patient and as well as to the examining physician. A whole range of technology that's that's barely that's barely been developed, and we have a lot to to be able to discover new ways to be able to touch and feel uh, your your patient to be able to examine them. Uh, it's there's a lot of work to be done, but I think we'll be able to do that. You know, one of the things, Joe, that I think is really interesting about this is the evolution of one-way holoportation into two-way holoportation. And clinically, when you go and interact with a doctor, it's a I see you, you see me kind of environment. So in other words, it's the two-way holoportation. But one of the things that's so critical to space medicine, as you've really very well described, is the fact that we have to be able to provide just-in-time training to crew medical officers in space. So we start off with two-way holoportation where the flight surgeon on the ground is talking to the astronaut crew medical officer, ICU, you see me. And then we transition to one-way holoportation where essentially I see what you see, you see my hands and follow what I'm doing. And that evolution is going to be really exciting to see us bringing that into routine use in low Earth orbit and then adding haptics to that. That's going to be incredible. And Dr. Williams, I completely agree with you. You know, there are medical schools now that are doing haptics work and there are medical schools that are doing lots of simulation work. And you're exactly right to be able to bring a physician in, you know, a teacher like yourself and bring them into a, a to a room and have them interact with a new student doctor. It adds tremendous confidence to both that both of those persons and to the patient themselves too, that that patient's getting the best possible care because they're getting not only the junior physician and also the senior physician, but they're working together. And the whole team feels good that, that, uh, that you're gonna get the best possible outcome. That is very Star Wars. That is <laughs> quite fascinating to think that we're, this is actually happening. So I guess my, my next question for you would be, um, what do you see as being kind of the, the next generation? What is being worked on now? We've talked about the haptics, but are there other features of heliportation that are being developed? Is it higher resolution imagery? The two, we began to talk a little bit about the two-way heliportation, which is amazing. So you're having a real-time conversation with somebody using the holo technology. Um, is there conversation or exploration around having multiple people participating in heliportation? Fernando, yes. what do you have up your sleeve? No, um, there are two. We are increasing three aspects of that holographic teleportation. One, of course, is resolution. Right now, is multi-user. Right now, we can have 300 people connected. So if it's possible, we can have three people experiencing the space station. And one of the goals is to do it on the moon. Imagine holographic teleport a lot of people to the moon and ex experience that. But one of the aspects, and Dr. William described that very well, is when we will go to Mars, we will have a huge delay in communication. We may have like a nine minute delay. Um, and the way to feel that is with artificial intelligence. We, uh, when, when I say that we, uh, Dr. Smith is leading this, is we are trying to incorporate artificial intelligence to fill that gaps and create a holographic assistant, someone that can with quantum computers that can understand some of the aspects and can fill those gaps in communications. That's one aspect. And the second aspect that we are also working on, um, at least we're projecting to work on this, is the possibility to move machines or manipulate machines. Imagine that I can have a robot on a station or on the moon, um, and Dr. Smith or Dr. Williams can manipulate that robot, like if they are there, but for the astronaut, you will be able to project a hologram overlaying that robot body. So for the crew member, it will be interacting with Dr. Smith or Dr. Williams on the moon. And it's going to be a body they can move and manipulate to move objects or an engineer. So essentially, we are aiming to those two aspects. One is artificial intelligence, and the other one is the possibility of manipulate hardware from distance. That is fascinating. So I'm, 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 artificial intelligence is a huge area of R&D, right? And there is actually multiple generations of robots being developed. Um, in fact, at NASA Johnson Space Center, and they're anticipated to support humans in the future. Perhaps you then communicate with your 
teleportation with the net with a robot with Robonaut 5 or Mount Valkyrie with uh, something that we're they were all pursuing. Um, I'm curious about how you each got into what you're doing. Um, kind of what are your your stories? You've talked about your professional development, the things that you're doing now, but what in life um, you know really got you interested and how did you pursue your path into uh, being where you are today? Yes, I, I shared a little bit about uh, how I became a flight surgeon. I share that because uh, if I could do it, anybody can do it. Uh, it is a wonderful set of circumstances where you get exposed to multiple things, just like Space Center Houston does. You expose these students to wonderful engineering and and videos and movies and people, and then those young kids get an idea of where they want to go in their career. And I thought at the time that you know I would do 40 years as a family physician and not be able to change. That was not the case actually. Throughout my career, I've continuously changed with doing family medicine to uh, sports medicine to taking care of uh, ladies and delivering babies and 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 doing orthopedic medicine and then doing aerospace. And then even at NASA, you can evolve your career as well. So I started off in the flight medicine clinic and then evolved to getting my shuttle certifications and ISS. And I worked for Dr. Williams for a number of years as well. And uh, then you do opportunities working with the Aquarius habitat and now coming up with new ways of, of how to do uh, delayed communication. Uh, things continuously change and we're able to continuously evolve. Uh, the partnership with working with Russians, Japanese, Canadians, the Europeans and the US and a number of other, uh, it's just continues to evolve who you get to rub elbows with and then with commercial, with Fernando de la Pena Yaka and, and with government and military. It's really a wonderful place to be in Houston to bring all those things together and continuously get exposed to new people, new opportunities, and in this case, off the planet, uh, opportunities to, to take te technology new places and medicine new places. So William, it just continues to evolve and uh, and you just keep your eyes open and look for the opportunities. The opportunities present themselves. People present themselves like this recording and uh, you just come together with people and come up with new ideas and goals and, and together with a stellar team like we've had for Holoportation 1 and 2, you can achieve things that you didn't even thought you could dream about. William, I might add that, uh, you know, I was a kid growing up in the 60s. I watched Alan Shepard lift off to go into space on a small black and white television, and I dreamt of becoming an astronaut. And of course, back in those days, Canada was the third country to put satellites into space, but we didn't have an astronaut program. So when people asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd be an astronaut. They said, well, you can't do that because Canada doesn't have an astronaut program. Well, lo and behold, if you believe in yourself and you believe in your dreams and you don't let other people define your dreams for you, it's amazing how things change over time. And one of the things that I love about being in this area of innovation and developing new technologies to further space exploration is that we have to drive technology to the point of failure to learn how to make the technology more robust and how to make it really functional in those extreme harsh environments that we work in, whether it's space or underwater. And there's this kind of yin yang relationship between developing technology for space and developing technology on Earth that, yes, we develop this technology based on the requirements to support medical care in space. But in so doing, we create a capacity that could be used in remote communities on Earth, made better, improved upon, and we take that newer technology back to space and we continue this cycle of technology development where literally everyone wins. And uh, we use the technology to further exploration in space, but we also use the technology to transform the way we deliver healthcare here on Earth. Very good. And my story is not as fascinated as uh, their story, but uh, when I was very young, uh, I was four, my parents bought me my first computer, a Commodore 64, and my Atari, which was the Xbox by our time and I used to program and interact with the computer and open the games and see the electronics and that interest grew over time. Uh, I was a huge, I'm still a huge fan of a TV show called Robotech or Micros, which is a 
TV show from Japan about space exploration, and I was fascinated. So by that, that interest increased, and when I was um, completing my bachelor's degree, uh, my dissertation actually was about space propulsion using antimatter to try to increase the, the, the speed of any spaceship, because I was wondering by that time, like, hey, uh, a trip to from Earth to Mars is going to take months, and there's there should be a better way. So that interest uh, grew every single time by being inspired by science fiction and stuff and toys. And my parents always gave me a lot of technology. Uh, my dad passed away when I was ten, no siblings, but my mother gave me ability to keep me happy and entertained. She gave me a lot of technology. Uh, we didn't have iPads, but that helped me to. Uh, increase my interest about technology and space. Thank you so much. Your stories are fascinating. And I think what I take from it is follow your passion and you have to, your passions will change over time. And I think it, the, the, the really the other insight I take away from that is uh, life changes so quickly, things evolve. And I love uh, Dave's story about how they're not being an astronaut corps when you were a child in, Can in Canada and, uh, and eventually there was one. So. There's always a way to fulfill your passions and you always have to pursue those, whatever they may be. It's absolutely fascinating. Well, when I look at a technology like teleportation, I absolutely can see all the applications here on Earth and how it can benefit us in so many different ways. Um, are, what are some other ways that you're exploring beyond that you have the two way communication now we talked about healthcare application. Um, are any of you uh, kind of exploring other applications that we haven't talked about today? Yes, uh, to bring in, as we mentioned, the telementoring. So if you're working on a, a difficult piece of equipment that you know, you've got procedures and you may have been trained on that particular piece of equipment two years ago, or maybe you've never had training, why not holoport in a wonderful mechanic and uh, or a technician or a person who has been using that piece of equipment for 20 years they know what's wrong and they can help you discover and diagnose the issue and repair it very, very quickly. And together, I think that would be a lot of fun to work together. You know, you, also things of how you can teach in remote locations. Why not bring the best possible instructors and the most eager students together, no matter where they might be, and no matter whatever their challenges in geographic challenges they might have, or even technology, challenges they might have. Dr. Fernando, he's got something up his sleeve to be able to use not only the HoloLens, but some all the other equipment that we have when it comes to cell phones. And so to be able to, to take education to locations that you may not have been able to bring it to teachers and students together will be great fun. There are other things that people are looking at to use holoportation and the so-called metaverse and this extended reality is to bring people to places that are impossible, places that are maybe historic in nature. The the uh, Roman ruins that are, you know, put them there from that time period and walk around together and enjoy the ancient, uh, uh, some of the ancient buildings, even go back to dinosaur time and and or to impossible areas like microscopic locations and walk around in the cell together and experiencing being in a cell and seeing all the chemistry and the biochemistry and everything else that will occur and maybe even science fiction universes which should, which don't even exist that'll be incredibly entertaining for people and and new art forms so like i said before this is something that when i saw the internet for the first time i was in pretty impressed. This is something that's really kind of blowing my mind of the science fiction is going to become science reality. Well, you've really got my imagination going. I would think it would be fascinating to teleport into a cell or and, and actually see how that functions or into an electronic circuit or I can imagine so many applications and absolutely, you know, transporting ourselves to some other period of time or some other historic event. Uh, to really have that empathetic experience. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. That is really interesting. Um, I'm curious, uh, are there other projects that you're all working on or other new technologies that you're collaborating on that are inspired by the, the, the HALA technology? 
Well, I think what we're hoping to be able to do is take where we're at today, continue the collaboration between the different partner groups, between NASA as a space agency, IEXA, uh, LEAP, and all these other groups working together, and then go back to the Aquarius undersea research environment, look at other analogs on Earth, maybe get some holoportation experiments done in the Antarctic or in the high Arctic, and start to really push the limits of this technology. You know, there's uh, tremendous opportunities, as Joe was talking about, the many different ways you can use this. But just imagine going into Space Center Houston and being able to holoport up to Washington and visit the Air and Space Museum. That'd be absolutely incredible. You know, so the only limit is the limit of our imagination in trying to figure this stuff out. So I think over the next three to four years, you can anticipate a lot of collaborative projects working together to test this technology in these new environments. That's for our viewers today. How can they get involved? Is there a way that they could either be test subjects or could learn more about holoportation? Uh, is, is there some opportunity for them to, to, to participate in the exploration and development of this technology? Well, from our standpoint, uh, we completed that first beta testing uh, section of our software like three weeks ago, and we're going to announce uh, in a couple of weeks, a second phase of that. And as you was describing, or Dr. Smith, we are not the only company developing holographic teleportation. This is the only company developing portable holographic teleportation. And I believe that this technology can help a lot of people. And to make it happen, the, it needs to be accessible. They, there are people that they don't have the time and the money to buy a $65,000 the holographic teleportation booth from other companies, but everyone has a smartphone. Everyone has a tablet and those smart glasses. There are companies, uh, Apple, Lenovo and other companies, they are releasing those glasses right now. So what we're trying to do is to make it accessible for anybody with existing devices that they already have, and then they can upgrade it. That way to be being involved is just Check our website. We are going to release a second phase of the beta testing. We had a lot of people during phase one. It went very well uh, using holographic teleportation, using any device like a smartphone. So if you want to get involved from our perspective, just follow us and check our website and we'll send you an invitation for the phase two. And if I if I may add to Dr. Fernando de la Pena's uh, wonderful discussion, yes, Everybody can be involved with this and you don't not, you do not need to be a programmer or, or a physician or an astronaut or anything specifically. You can bring whatever your specialty is. And actually that's as Dr. Williams stated, we want to collaborate with people that are way outside of our our normal sphere of uh, influence or our, our group so that we can work together on problems that they have and that we have because they're going to bring new ideas and we're going to bring new their ideas. And then when you come together with someone who from a different background, whether it be a, a different specialty or a, a sports person or another another country in a different language, you come up with new crazy ideas that you wouldn't have come up with if you didn't come together. So the ability to just get in the community would will open people's eyes. There are uh, XR communities in Houston. There's also the ION, which is an entrepreneurial uh, building and organization downtown Houston that's bringing together people to do business and um, new development, commercial. There's the medical center as well that's developing XR. All of these uh, hardware companies are releasing software development kits for those programmers and kids out there and students in computer science and mathematicians, et cetera, to develop their own worlds and develop new objects. So the sky is no longer the limit. Folks can get involved in any one of these places, uh, read anything you can about holoportation and keep your eye on all the technology. It's coming to us uh, from all these different companies want to develop it, but they develop the hardware. They don't have the use cases. It's the people that have the problems and the solutions and these creative ideas. They're going to come up and create the new world. You know, I think, William, one way to look at this is we're, we're talking about something exciting, the holoverse. And fundamentally, when you take this technology and put it in the minds of in the hands of many different people from all over the world, creativity will be unlimited. 
And we're going to see all sorts of unique applications of this technology. But you know, certainly from the perspective of enhancing the quality of healthcare globally, uh, providing uh, remote solutions and maintenance of equipment, servicing, all these different things, the educational experiences allowing us to send individuals out into different unique environments on Earth. It's going to be really exciting watching this holoverse evolve. What an exciting conversation. I think we need to have a test area at Space Center Houston where people can come out and try out the, the Holo, HoloLens. And I love the holoverse uh, uh, representation of our world because I think it's really true. It, it is a great way to open up our world past and present and also for the future. William, if I may, you have to experience this, and there are different ways you can experience it. You know, there is the the uh, virtual reality. You can use the Google um, Cardboard and use your smartphone, and that's a early way to do it, and it's an inexpensive way if you've got a smartphone. And then to go to some of the libraries and some of the of the uh, different uh, uh, organizations who do maker sheds and things like that. Some of those guys and gals have these these devices. You have to experience that. The one-way holoportation was incredible. The two-way holoportation was out of this world to be able to experience uh, someone coming from another location. Uh, people have to experience it. We can describe it, but when you see it and feel it and hear it, it will change your idea of what reality is. Uh, this is such a fascinating conversation, and I'm sad to say we're coming to the close of our time together and our conversation. And so I wanted to give each of you a moment just to share a closing thoughts on our topic of discussion today. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and your time. It's a huge honor to share this scenario with Dr. Williams and, and Dr. Smith. And let me tell you, each of us were inspired by science fiction in some way. And I believe that people from visiting Space Center Houston or visiting these blogs, they have a crazy idea about something that they can do, that they can perform, they, they are dreaming with that. And that they can make it real. As Dr. Williams mentioned, he had the idea to be an astronaut uh, without any space program in place, and he went to space twice. So from our standpoint, we had the idea to create something from science fiction, like holographic teleportation. I believe that everyone that can dream can achieve their goals. Um, a friend of mine told me that you can be as big as your dreams or as small as your dubs. So if you have dubs, you will not make it. But if you dream big, you will overcome and will make it real. So hopefully this video will help to inspire someone else with an idea. And that idea will be helpful to improve the, um, the, our life in humankind, the human, the human life here on Earth and also in space. I tell you, this is an interesting and a wonderful time to be alive and people talk about, they think about what they should do in life. And I'm reminded of the Japanese word ikegai, which is, uh, it basically says there are four things that are good. And if you can line these four things up, you will have a wonderful life and a wonderful profession. And people talk about passion. We should always be passionate about it, but the Japanese have a way to say, do something that you like doing, do something that you are good at and you can train to be good at do something that you'll get paid for because you got to learn a living and do something that's good for the world and if you combine all of those things together you will be satisfied throughout your life and you'll be satisfied that and you'll be paid and you'll do things that other people are interested in doing so that's one way to look at career and look at life at goals and the other thing that i experience with this holoportation is what i experience at nasa all the time is the feeling of teamwork, bringing people together that are really good at what they do and work together on a common goal and respect each other. And they come from different backgrounds and they bring the best out of each other. And together that feeling of achieving a goal and the all the activity that you have and the hard work, you feel that teamwork all the way through as well. And to have an overall goal to improve life and improve health and improve the ability to explore and then holoportation to me it will allow all of us to experience space flight from space center houston connecting up to the to the moon and connecting to iss and for the crew members also to come down and experience it as well as the aquarius habitat to experience that virtually in reality 
and to experience history. This is a wonderful time to be alive. And thanks to Space Center Houston for exposing all the students, whether they're elementary or folks that are in, you know, on in their career and older, you guys are doing a wonderful job to expose people to and, and show all these new technologies and all the history and all the places we can go. And William, I might summarize by saying this is an incredible millennium. This is the millennium in which humans will become a spacefaring species. Since the year 2000, we've had humans permanently living and working on board the International Space Station. Yes, we rotate the crews out, but fundamentally we've had a permanent human presence in space continuously since uh, the dawn of this millennium. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And one of the things that I think you've heard from Fernando and from Joe is this passion for the development of new technology. Within the space programs globally, we like to take the letters I am out of the word impossible and think about what we need to do to make the impossible possible. We take science fiction and turn it into science fact. I watched Star Trek back in the early days in 1960s thinking about the beaming technology. Never did I think that I would be the first person participating in a two-way beaming holoportation to the space station and I bet Joe didn't think he was going to be the first person ever to be holoported to space because that was science fiction. It's turned into science fact. And I think the challenge is for the next generation to embrace innovation and think about your willingness to go out and try doing something new and different and your willingness to learn from failure because it's what you do when you don't succeed that determines whether you will succeed. And perhaps somebody listening to this podcast uh, today, this webinar today, may become one of those first astronauts stepping on the surface of Mars, embracing the routine utilization of holoportation is one of many technologies that will enable those missions and make them possible. And if you do that, I hope you sign autographs and send photos to Joe Fernando and I because we're there with you and we want you to have a fantastic experience. Wow, I can't top that for closing remarks. Those are fantastic. I want to thank our three panelists today for this incredibly stimulating conversation. And I know we're, we're going to post the IXA website link on our website so all of you can link, click on that and learn more about this incredible technology. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And again, for more information about Space Center Houston and our Thought Leader series, please go to our website at spacecenter.org and follow us on social media and check out the Space Center Houston blog. Again, thank you for our panelists, our panelists for this incredible conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.